Hello class, welcome to today's lesson. I'm Mr. Kevin Jaggi from the School of Computing and Informatics. I'll be taking you networking essentials. The objective of today's lesson is to understand what is a computer network, what are the various devices that we use to connect computers uh, together, what are the various a classification of networks that exist that you can use to network computers together and what are the various types of networks that exist that one can use to set up a network. We go straight to our first topic which is introduction to computer networks and we'll start by understanding what is a computer network. A computer network is an interconnection of two or more computers with associated devices so that you can be able to share resources together and communicate. And this connection or interconnection of computers involves connecting one computer with the other with the use of a cable or with the use of a wireless connection. When you connect computers together with a cable, you can use uh, either of the three types of cables that exist in the market. There is the twisted pair cable, there is the coaxial cable, and there is also the fiber optic cable. That is a wired network. You can also network computer without using a physical cable, but by using a wireless connection, we have existing wireless uh, technologies that exist such that this computer and this can communicate with each other and even share resources without a physical cable by use of technologies such as uh, Bluetooth, uh, Wi-Fi, uh, infrared transmissions, uh, WiMAX, uh, and so on. So all those wireless technologies facilitate communication of computers together without a physical cable. So you can connect computers in those two basic ways, and that is what we refer to as a network. And these can be computers alongside with associated devices like printers, scanners, uh, mobile phones, uh, handheld devices like uh, the mobile phones, the tablets, and so on, which can link together such that you can share resources from one device to the other. That is what we refer to as a network. Otherwise, without a network, the sharing of resources would be physical. If you want to transfer a file from computer A to computer B, then you transfer it using a removable a media like a flash disk from this computer to you carry it to this other computer uh, physically. But with the network, you don't require to do that. That is the reason why computers are networked together. Then, what are these resources that we share in a, in a network? What are the reasons why you connect computers together? It's because uh, by doing so, you're able to share resources. What are those resources? By networking computers together, you're able to share hardware resources. And hardware resources involves things like a, a printer, a scanner, disk for storage, that would uh, help uh, solve the problem of buying each and every of those hardware devices for each and every computer. For instance, from this particular diagram, you can see there are quite a number of computers. You can connect them to a single printer, such that the users within that particular network, they can be able to share that single printer in the network. That one is sharing a hardware a resource. You can also share a software resource, such as software applications, programs, data, anything that is in soft form, such that you can have a software application residing in a server computer, a central computer, such that the other users within the network, they can be able to download that application or use that application that is residing in the server use it to create a file from their workstation computers, and then when they close that application program, it will still reside in the server, 
and they still use it like it is in their own installed in their own computers. That way, that will also uh, solve the problem of acquiring expensive softwares for each and every computer. That is sharing a software resource. And also, by networking computers together, you are able to achieve the aspect of communication. You can be able to send an email from one computer to the other. And if these computers are not uh, connected together, that would not be possible. So networking came up as a technology to facilitate uh, these three aspects. And when you connect computers together, you can do so by use of a number of network devices. You can use quite a number of network devices to connect computers together, but the connection or the number of devices that you'll use in a network depends on what kind of a network you are setting up. If you are setting up a simple network, uh, then you'd require the basic devices like the terminals, the computers, and the network cable. But if you are setting up a complex network, then you require complex devices that are going to help you to manage that particular network. Things like the server, the, the hub, the bridge, the routers, the gateway, and so on. So the choice of a network device depends on the kind of a network you are setting up. Each of these network devices, starting with the uh, terminal, the workstation, the client computer, the server, the network adapter card, the transmission medias, the hub, the repeaters, the bridge, the routers, the routers, and the gateway, each of these network devices has a specific function. So the choice of one depends on the kind of a network that you are setting up. So we are going to look at uh, each of these network devices and see what are their functions in a network and uh, why do we use them? What, do they, what function do they perform in a network? And we start with a, a terminal. A terminal is a network device whose function is just to act as an input or an output device in a network. And they are classified into three depending on what kind of a terminal it is. It can be a dump terminal, it can be intelligent terminal, or it can be a graphic terminal. A dump terminal, as the name indicates, is just an input or an output device in a network. It can be just a screen, it can be an input device like a, a keyboard, a mouse, just to either put resources into a network or to access resources to access resources from a network. But an intelligent terminal, it's a terminal that has its own processing capability. It is a, it's a device that can work on its own. It has a processor, it has a memory, it has a disk for storage, and it can be able to perform its uh, functions as a unit on its own. So it is intelligent in the fact that it can perform a, a processing capabilities and can also participate in the network even by doing basic processing. And graphic terminal is also an input or an output device within the network that you can use mostly to work with the graphical uh, pieces of data or data that is in graphic form, in form of videos, in form of pictures, uh, therefore, this kind of a terminal has also a higher processing capability uh, such that you can be able to process data that is in graphical uh, form. So a terminal is just an input or an output device in a network. Then uh, another network device is a workstation. A workstation is a, a computer equipped with its own uh, processor, uh, a storage capability, in terms of disk and the memory. So it's a computer that can work on its own. This computer can perform functions independent of the others in the network, or it can be connected to the network to share resources or to expand the resources so that they can be accessed by, by other users in the network. 
in a normal network, like you can see from this particular uh, picture here, these are an office setup with computers within the office. These ones can be regarded as work stations. You can work with these computers on their own without connecting them to the network. Or you can connect the network such that whatever resources that you have from this computer, they can be shared by other users within the network. So a workstation can be connected to the network or it can work on its own uh, within the network. So it's also a network uh, device. Then we also have a client computer. And a client computer comes as a network device if the network is set up in the form of uh, a server-based kind of a network where there is a server in the network and there are other computers that are accessing resources from this particular server. So a, a client computer is a computer that accesses the shared resources from the network. The resources that you have just mentioned, the hardware resources, the software resources, and uh, the aspect of communication are accessed by the client computer. So within this kind of a network setup, the client computers accesses the shared resources, and those resources are shared by the server computer. So the server controls what these client computers are accessing. And in this particular uh, network setup, again, the server computer shares the resources across the network while the client computer accesses those resources. And it depends on what kind of a server computer that is in the network. And the kind of the server that you use in a network depends on what resource you are sharing on the network. Remember, we have said you can share hardware resources, software resources, and other aspects of communication, which may involve even sharing a file. So if you are sharing uh, files within a network, then you require to have a file server. A file server is used to share files, uh, data, any kind of information or materials that is in soft form. This will facilitate users across the network to access materials, files, or even softwares that are stored centrally from the server. So you require a, a, a file server. A server can also be a database server. And a database server is used to share a database application across the network. Most organizations are managed or the data is managed by use of a database application. And instead of installing that database application in each and every computer from the users, then you can have it centrally placed on the server such that users can access it from a central point. And whatever kind of data manipulation or entry of data that you carry out, it is stored from a central point, which is the server. That way, you'd require a database server, which will host the database uh, application software such that the users can access it through the client computers. Then you also have the print server, just like we have seen earlier. You can have several computers sharing a single printer, which is a hardware device, and solve the problem of acquiring a printer for each and every computer within the network or in, the, in, in, in a particular office setup. That way, you require a print server which will be configure, configured in the network uh, through one of the computers in the network such that the users can print from that computer directly as if it is connected to their individual computers. That way, you solve the problem of acquiring a hardware device like a printer for each and every computer and therefore you require a print server. You also have a disk server. A disk server is a server with a large storage spaces, large disk 
spaces that can be shared among multiple users in an organization, in an institution, a learning institution, such that every user is allocated a space within the disk server where using the client computers on the network, they can be able to access that storage space. Each user is given a username and a password to access their storage space where they can store data and access them from any computer so long as they are within the network. That way, you solve the problem of acquiring a large disk spaces for each and every computer on the network. In an organization, we, are, we have several employees. Instead of having individual computers with large disk spaces for each and every employee, we can connect them with a disk server such that the, there is one server computer with large storage and they will share the same storage and they will effectively utilize the space and save on the cost. And when the employee leaves the organization, the same space can be allocated to another employee. If it's a learning institution, then the students who clear a course, their spaces can be allocated to the new students who are joining the, the institution. So, and, and that way, the spaces can be effectively uh, utilized. So in a network, uh, the server is used to share both hardware resources and software resources where you can use either of these uh, servers depending on what you are sharing in a network. And in a single network, we can have a combination of these multiple servers. You don't have to have a single server for each and every network. Or you can have one server serving the purpose of all these functionality. Just configure it uh, to serve the purpose depending on what you are sharing the network. Then we have another network device, a network uh, adapter card or a network interface card. A network adapter card is a physical interface between the computers and the transmission media. Between the computers and the transmission media, which can be either a cable or through a wireless connection, it's a link between the two. The, from the previous uh, diagram, these computers are connected directly through a physical cable or through a wireless connection. From where the transmission media gets to into the computer is where we have the network adapter card or the network interface card. This is where the network cable gets into. And therefore, this particular card, which is usually uh, co integrated or connected together into the inside of the computer, acts as an interface between the transmission media, which is the cable or wireless connection that connects to the other computers in the network. So it's a link or an interface between the communicating computers, both the, from the transmitter and the receiver side. And it has quite a number of uh, functions. The network interface card has a number of functions. One, it establishes and manages a network connection. It is through the network interface card that a connection is established because for any communication to take place, there must be the sender and the receiver, the transmitter and the receiver of the message. And in that particular network adapter card is where we have the network addresses, they reside there, the IP address. So they determine who is transmitting and who is receiving. It is the first connection point where it is established. And then it translates digital data into signals for outgoing messages. Uh, if we look, go back to the previous uh, network uh, diagram, if you look at this particular connection here, the data that is coming from the source computer travels through the transmission media, which is wired or wireless, to get to the receiver's end here. The way data is organized from the transmitting computer is in digital form. 
But the transmission of data along the transmission media here is in form of a signal. So it is the work of the network adapter card to convert the digital data from the transmitting computer into signals for outgoing messages so that it can be able to travel through the transmission media and from signals back into digital data so that the receiving computer can be able to receive that data. So it is the work of the network interface card to convert a digital data into signals and from signals into digital data for incoming messages so that the message can be received correctly within the network. Also, the network uh, adapter card uh, converts a serial data into parallel data and vice versa. How does this happen? Inside the computer, the transmitting computer, data is formatted or it's transmitted in parallel form because the mode of transmission inside the computer is in multiple transmission medias. But when it gets out through the cable, as we have seen in our previous diagram, it travels through a serial cable where data, the bits of data, they are transmitted one after the other. So it converts from a parallel data from the, the setting computer into serial data so that it can be transmitted along the transmission media uh, and, be, and flow to, be, to be received by the receiving computer, it is converted from the serial to parallel data again so that the data can be received correctly by the receiving computer. And lastly, the network adapter card has a buffer. A buffer is a temporary storage unit to control the flow of data. Like we have said, data getting out of the, the, the setting computer is in parallel form, so it is in multiple. And once it gets out, it flows one bit after the other. So the work of the network adapter card is to temporarily hold those pieces of data so that it can control the flow of data both from the sending and the receiving computer so that data can flow uh, systematically and it can to control the flow amount of the data that is flowing both into the computer and out of the computer. The other uh, network device is the transmission media and the transmission media is a link or a path between the transmitter and the receiver. It is a path or the link between the sending device and the receiving device which can be either wired transmission and wired transmissions are refer also referred to as guided transmission media or they can be a wireless transmission or unguided transmission media. For wired transmission, like we have said earlier, there is a physical link between the source and the destination. There is a physical cable connecting the sending computer and the receiving computer. And these cables can be a twisted pair cable, can be coaxial cable, or it can be a fiber optic cable. There is a physical cable that you can see with your eyes connecting computer A and computer B. That is a wired transmission media, which is also referred to as a guided transmission media or a bounded transmission media. A transmission media can also be a wireless transmission media, meaning that there is no physical link between the transmitter and the receiver. But there is a transmission technology that facilitates the two devices to communicate with each other in a network. And in this case, uh, there are quite a number of wireless transmission uh, technologies that exist. Wi-Fi or wireless fidelity. We also have uh, Bluetooth infrared transmissions, uh, microwave transmissions, satellite transmissions, 
all those are wireless transmission medias and all of them data is transmitted in form of a signal from the source to destination we also have the hub it is a network device and the function of the hub in a network is to bring the media segments together it centralizes the media segments so that the devices can be connected together into a single network it is not possible to connect all these computers directly to each other unless you use a central device where the cables get through so, and, and from each and every computer so that this computer can communicate with this and it can communicate with each and every computer on the network so the hub acts as a centralizing device it organizes the cables together and brings the media segments together uh, to act as a central device but it depends on what kind of the hub that you connect into the network there are three types of hub that you can connect to the network and they perform different functions on the network apart from bringing the media segments together and acting as a centralizing device we have the passive hub the active and also the intelligent hub if you connect uh, the passive hub into a network like in this particular diagram then a computer let's say computer one communicating with computer two through the passive hub as the name indicates the signals will just pass through that particular hub it will not do anything else to those particular signals other than to allow them to pass through it then into the other network devices but if it is active it is active in the sense that it will pick the signals from the source computer amplify them or regenerate them then retransmit to all the computers connected in the network and the regeneration of the signals here now gives the signal more strength so that it can travel a longer distance without becoming weaker and weaker within the transmission media so the signals are able to go a longer distance you're able to connect computers over a, a longer uh, geographical area and they pick the signal they amplify them then retransmit to all the computers and in a network only the destination computer will receive the message you'll be able to decode the message the others will ignore you know them if the destination address does not match their address but if it is an intelligent hub an intelligent hub knows the address of each and every computer connected to to it so it knows that the address of this computer is computer one this is two this is three and all of them so if it picks a message from computer one that is destinated to computer three it will only uh, forward the messages through the destination path and not broadcasting them to all the computers like the active hub so the intelligent hub functions like the active hub by amplifying and regenerating the signals but it retransmits the signals only through the destination path that's why it's referred to as an intelligent hub because it is intelligent in the sense that it knows the addresses of each and every computers that are connected to it in a network and like the active hub that just broadcast the message to all the computers that are connected to it in a network so the active hub the passive hub and the intelligent hub they act as a centralizing device but they also perform other functions like either broadcasting the message or sending to the respective devices depending on the type of hub that is connected in the network we also have a repeater a repeater is another network device and the function of a repeater in a network is to extend the physical length of a network the physical size of a network 
when you set up a network initially maybe a small network but as the time goes on you add more computers into the network and the network keeps on growing and becoming a larger and larger and to extend the physical size of a network we require a repeater the work of the repeater is to amplify the signals and retransmits them within the transmission link of a network so that those signals they can be able to go a longer distance because within the transmission media whether it is a wired network or a wireless network the signals may become weaker and weaker as they travel through the transmission media we refer to that in network as attenuation the weakening of the signal as they travel through the transmission media and the signals may reach to a point where they cannot travel any further I initially the signal is strong as it travels along the transmission media it reaches a point where it cannot travel any further and in a network to ensure the signals reaches a particular destinated point that you want in a network then you install the repeaters along the transmission link such that they'll pick the signal before it becomes too weak amplify that signal and retransmit it in the network and before again that signal becomes very weak it emits another repeater and the process is repeated until the network size of your network the, the one that you want where you want it to reach is achieved for physical computer networks we have the repeaters installed along the link like in this particular aspect before the signal becomes very weak it emits a repeater is a repeater amplifies the original bit pattern of the signal then the signal is retransmitted again uh, another distance let's say this one was 100 meters another 100 meters it emits another repeater another 100 meters until the physical size of a network is achieved for wireless networks like in mobile net uh, mobile phones you'll find uh, the boosters refer to them as boosters in mobile network but they are repeaters in network where they pick the signals and amplify them and transmit them for another particular distance so that the devices within that particular region can be able to connect to the network and the process goes on up to a particular intended distance in that particular network that's why you see there's a booster at a particular point after a few meters or after a kilometer there's another one and after a distance there's another one to pick the signals before they become very weak and amplify them retransmit them and thereby you are able to extend the physical size of a network we also have a network bridge the main function of a network bridge is to filter network traffic within a single network you may have one network a large network maybe a single local area network and to control the way the data flows within that single network you may divide it into segments like in a learning institution like this one you may have a network within this side of the campus another network on the other side of the student center or in another different uh, building such that those networks are interconnecting together through a bridge and just like the normal foot bridge that allows people to close from one side to the other the same way the messages or data packets will be either allowed to cross over to the other network segment or not depending on where they are coming in that way the bridge will be able to filter network traffic between network segments of a single network so how does it function how does a, a bridge a function if a data packet is flow coming from a computer on this network segment and the destination is on the same network segment let's say from computer one the message is destined to computer 2 if that message happens to get to the bridge it will not be allowed to cross over to this other side 
Because on this side, there is no destination address to that particular message. If it is coming from same network segment to same network segment, the destination is on same network segment, it's not allowed to cross over here. It is discarded, it is destroyed. But if it is from this network segment and the destination is on this other side, when that data packet gets to the bridge, it is allowed to cross over to this other side. That way, the bridge is able to filter data because it does not allow messages or data packets that are not destinated to this side to come to this other side, which will, is going to create a lot of data traffic that is unnecessary to this other side. If the data packets are coming from this computer, the destination is to this computer, which is on the same network segment, if it comes to this, happen to get to the bridge, it's not allowed to cross over. But if it is from this computer to this computer, it will be allowed to cross over to this other side. That way, in a single network, uh, it performs network management by determining what is allowed to move on to the other network segment or to remain to the same network segment depending on the destination addresses. Therefore, the bridges normally maintain a bridging table which contains addresses to various destination devices on the network. The next network device is a router and the work of the router is to route messages from one source to a particular destination. In a network which is an interconnection of multiple devices with multiple a path that leads to a particular destination, the router looks at the path that is faster and the most economical to direct those messages to that particular destination and choose that particular path. The shorter route might be available, but it is busy transmitting data packets from another source computer. And therefore, the router will choose what is the next available route that is available, that is faster, and direct the messages. So there are multiple paths leading to a particular destination, and the router looks at those particular paths and tries to choose the best that is faster and economical and direct those messages through those particular paths. And just like the bridge, also the routers maintain a routing table which contains destination addresses to all the computers within the network and therefore when it is subjected to transmission of data to a particular destination it just looks at which route is available which route is faster for that particular transmission and directs all the messages through that particular uh, path the next uh, network uh, device is a brooter and a brooter is a two-in-one device it's a router at the same time a bridge it performs the function of two devices it functions as a brooter as a, as a router or as a bridge depending on what kind of data it is subjected to to transmit within the network if it receives a packet that is a routable it will function as a router but if it receives a packet that is not routable, it will automatically function as a bridge. So when it receives a packet that is routable, they will just choose the best path and forward that particular message uh, through those particular paths they have selected, which is faster and the most economical, and forward those pa uh, data packets through. Otherwise, it will function as a bridge by allowing the message to move to the next segment or not based on the hardware address. And just like we have said with the bridge, if the message is coming from the same segment to the same segment, it will not allow it to close over through the bridge to this other network segment. For instance, let's say this network segment A, network segment B. And the message is coming from segment A to A, then if it gets to the bridge, it's not allowed to cross over. So when it functions as a bridge, 
it looks at the destination address and the source address. If it is from the same segment to the same segment, the bridge will discard those data packets. But if it is from one network segment to another, it will allow it to close over to this other uh, side. So a bruta, bruta is both a bridge and a router into one network device. Then we have a, a, a gateway is our last network device, which is a protocol converter. And a gateway is the entry point of every network where you set up a security a settings into a particular uh, network because it's the entry point and the exit point. And apart from that, it also performs the aspect of protocol conversion. The aspect of protocol conversion, it operates at the presentation layer of the network model. And the reason why it is put at the entry point and the exit point of a network is to ensure uniformity across the network. Whatever data packets are coming from this particular uh, network, for them to be uniform across the network such that the receiving devices on different other networks are able to understand that particular network, it has to be standard. So the, the gateway receives data packets formatted in one particular protocol, and before forwarding them or transmitting them, converts them into other standard uh, protocols and retransmits the data packets already formatted into standard protocols so that the rest of the network can be able to understand uh, those data packets. So we have quite a number of network devices. They are not limited to those few that we have just uh, mentioned, but the choice of a network device within a network depends on the size of the network, the purpose of the network, and the amount of data that you'll be transmitting in that particular uh, network. And each, like we have seen, each network device has its own function. So as you set up a network, you look at your, the network that you are setting up, the size, and choose specific network devices that will perform specific functions depending on the network that you are setting up. Uh, the other part that you are going to look at is the classification of networks. Now, you have set up a network. You can set up a small network, a large network, or an average size network, depending on the purpose of the network, which can be classified as either local area network, metropolitan area network, or wide area network. So, based on the geographical area that your network will cover, it can be categorized into those three in terms of size. A small network is regarded as a local area network. A large network is regarded as a wide area network. And an average size network, which is not either small or large, is regarded as a metropolitan uh, area network. Let us look at each of these uh, type of network. A local area network is a small network that is privately owned. It can be owned by a company, an institution, or uh, a business setup, such that an organization or a company can be able to share resources within that single organization. It is usually privately owned, and it covers a small geographical area just a few kilometers in size, the maximum radius of three kilometers, a small network within an organization or a learning institution, such that resources can be shared between computers within that organization or across the devices. It's regarded to as a local area network. And in most cases, it is privately owned because it is owned by a particular organization a particular company, just to facilitate the sharing of resources we have, we have just discussed, both the hardware resources and the software resources, and so that users within 
a single organization can be able to communicate using those computers. That is referred to as a local area network. A network which covers a small geographical area and the users within that network can be able to share resources together. Then we have an average size a network which is referred to as uh, a metropolitan area network. It can be a single network or it can be as a result of connecting multiple local area networks together to form one large network. You can have this institution local area network connected with another institution local area network in another institution local area network, the three of them, they are linked up together to form one large network. It's defined to as a metropolitan area network, such that resources can be shared across those institutions or these organizations. And that way, uh, it will be able to achieve the objective of sharing the resources and communication across different multiple networks. And uh, uh, as well as across the devices, this could be a single local area network for a single organization, another local area network of another organization, and another one. The three of them linked up together uh, will form a metropolitan area network. So it's larger than the local area network, and it facilitates in, uh, interconnection and sharing of resources across those local area networks. And for a large network, which may cover a country, a continent, or the entire world, that kind of a network, we refer to it as a wide area network. It's a network that covers a large geographical area. And this kind of a network allows the users in the network to share resources across the large geographical area, which could be as a result of multiple networks connected together such that they cover a large geographical area which may be a country or a continent or even the entire world. In most cases, uh, wide area networks, they utilize uh, public or leased resources. Therefore, this communication can cover a large geographical area. Like you can see in this particular diagram, this is a satellite that is connecting different multiple uh, regions. Could be a continent, this continent, another continent, and they are able to communicate uh, in form of a network through this network device, which is the, the, the satellite. Therefore, the transmission can be able to cover a large geographical area. Internet is a good example uh, of a wide area network. When you are connected through the World Wide Web, you can be able to access any, uh, any uh, material or any data through the World Wide Web so long as you are connecting to the internet in any part of the world and that is facilitated uh, through the wide area connection. Then we have different network types. Through that uh, single network or through that a small network, whether it's a local area network, a metropolitan area network, or a wide area network, you can connect the computers in two ways, either through a peer-to-peer -peer network or through a server-based, which in this case now does not depend on whether it's a small network or a large network, but the kind of the setup here uh, that determines the type of a network is based on whether there is a central control over how resources are being shared on the network or there is the general uh, sharing of the resources. If there is no control over how resources are shared, then that kind of a network connection is referred to as a peer-to-peer -peer network. But if there is a central control over the sharing of the resources, it's referred to as a server-based network. But the most basic of all networks involves connecting uh, 
computers together, which could be two computers and associated devices like printers and scanners together. But that connection can be done in those two basic ways, either of a peer-to-peer -peer connection or through a server-based network. Let us look at each of those two and see how it is set up. When you connect computers in a peer-to-peer -peer network connection, then there is no control over how those resources are shared. All these are client computers. These are client computer, these are client computer, and these are the client computer. Whatever resources are like that are on each computer, each user decides on what resources to share and what not to share because there is no central control over how these resources are shared within the network. The security of the resources that are within each of these client computers depends on individual client computers uh, users. The storage uh, application of security measures within those resources depends on individual users. There is no, sh uh, the sharing of the resources within this particular uh, network such as files and printers depends on individual users. There is no central control. When you set up this kind of a network setup, the peer-to-peer -peer network, it has a number of advantages over the other network setup uh, type that is a server based. One, it is easy to set up and configure. As you can see from this particular diagram, we just require computers that are of the same capability, the client computers, and link them together. So you don't require to acquire uh, expensive network equipment like the server to manage the network, uh, to employ a dedicated network administrator to manage this network. It is quite easy to set up and it is uh, cheap to do so. It is very easy to set up and configure this kind of a network. Uh, individual machines do not depend on the presence of a dedicated server and therefore any client computer within the network can link up to this kind of a network and participate in a network. Each user controls their own shared resources. There is no central monitoring point of how resources are being shared. So each user controls what they want to share on the network. Each user of the individual client computer determines what to share and what not to share. Unlike in the other server-based network where uh, resources are shared from a central point. It is cheap to purchase and operate because you just require computers and the transmission medias. You link them together and uh, there you have the network. You don't require additional softwares to manage this network and even to manage the users of this particular network. A simple setup or uh, desktop operating system and uh, the basic hardware devices that have the same capability, and there you have your network. You don't require to employ dedicated network administrators to, sell, to manage this network because uh, each user manages his own data, each user manages his own resources within the network. And therefore, in case of any issues with the network, each individual user is able to sort out his or her own issues. So you don't require to have a dedicated administrators which is likely to increase the cost of the network. But this particular network is not suitable for large networks. It is suitable for networks with 10 or less users. So it's only suitable for a small uh, network. There are some disadvantages of this kind of a network, a network type, the peer-to-peer. One, the network security applies to a single resource at a time. If you have to secure this kind of a network, you have to do it for each and every client computer. But unlike for the uh, server-based network, where you can monitor the network from a central point, you don't have to move to each and every computer within the network. This one, uh, you have to do it individually, which 
requires a lot of time. And again, you have to secure each and every resource at a time. Users may be forced to have as many passwords as they are uh, resources within the network. You have to have unique password and username for each and every client computer. Unlike for the server-based network, where you just require a single username and a password, and you can access all the resources within the network because it is centrally monitored and uh, controlled. In this particular uh, network, peer-to-peer, -peer, there is no centralized uh, monitoring of how resources are accessed and different resources on the network, and therefore it becomes tedious to manage this kind of a network. Again, we have said it's not suitable for a large network where you have more than 10 users. Therefore, if it's in an organization with more than 10 users, this would not be the best a network type to set up. And then the last one, number two, is a, the network a type. The second network type is the server-based network type. Uh, the server-based network type, there is a server that is managing the other client computers. And as we have said earlier, the work of the server is to uh, share resources across the network so that the client computers can access them, whether it's a print server, a file server, a database server, or a disk server. Whatever resources that you want to share on the network are managed by the server. And therefore, the server controls all the resources that are shared in this network. It acts as a central monitoring point of the network. It is the one that manages all the resources that are being shared within the network. When you set up this kind of a network, there are quite a number of uh, advantages. One, there is a centralized user account and also uh, security and access control which simplifies the network administration of this network. You can control it from a single point, which is through the server. You can manage all the, the client computers that are linked up to that server. And because we have the server, which is a powerful computer, it means that there is efficient uh, access and sharing of the network resources. So you can share whatever resources that you have within individual client computers or uh, through the central point, through the server, they can be accessed through the, the client computers. A single password will deliver access to all the network resources, and therefore you don't require to have a password for each and every computer within the network. And again, uh, it is suitable for large networks, networks with more than 10 users. In an organization where you have more than 10 users, this would be the best uh, type of a network to set up. It is suitable for large networks because even sharing of resources becomes very easy. And it also has some disadvantages when you set up a server-based network. Uh, the worst is that because it has a central monitoring point, that is through the server. Failure of the server means that the entire network is down. So at any given point, if the central device fails, that it will affect the entire community of network users, unlike uh, the peer-to-peer -peer network, where a failure of one computer uh, does not affect the others, because each user is managing its own resources. In server-based network, failure of the server results to area of the entire network. And because in this particular network, you require a complex uh, special purpose uh, softwares to manage the network, which may also require one to allocate an expert a staff member to manage the network, which is the network administrator. And this one also increases the cost. Also, the dedicated devices like the server which are uh, expensive, also increases the cost of setting up this uh, network. So it is the best for large networks, but it has some disadvantages in terms of cost uh, that are incurred in equipment and management of the network. That is the end of our lesson today.
we stop at that point and when we meet in our next class we will look at our next topic which is on network topologies thank you these televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our mku online platform you can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform we are in a digital era and mount kenya university knows this the following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke. Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.